Hi, this is Christina Sazawa, Chief Strategy Officer of Shims and founder of Measure of Music. You're listening to the Your Morning Coffee podcast with my friends Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Weekly music news for the new music business. From The Guardian, how are musicians supposed to survive on less than two one hundredths of a penny? Per stream? And from Billboard, RIAA Report 2023 Takeaways, is the U.S. too reliant on paid subscriptions? Well, Jay and I have so much to talk about, including some things on AI. Yes, indeed. And we got many more things besides that to cover. We're glad you're here. We're going to start the podcast right about now. Stand by for transmission. This is London Calling. Wake up! Your morning coffee is on the air. 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 On for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Good day to you, Mr. Jay Gilbert. It is good to see you. We are both chugging water. Yes, we and are. Yet, and it's pouring rain outside. So, uh, well, not where I am, but I think since you're north coming. of me, it's it's on its way. It is on its way. Uh, I, I keep meaning to play that song, It Never Rains in California, uh, as an intro, but I haven't done it yet. But it <laughs> clearly does all the time. And, yes, it does. Uh, we are loving it. And it is good to see you. You just got back from Nashville. And oh, my goodness, uh, I know you had a great time. Yeah, I, I love Nashville. Always love going there. Had some really great meetings. And I'm going back there for the uh, Music Business Association uh, Conference, Music Biz 2024. By the way, we'll talk about it a little bit more um, when we go through the ad script, but you know they've been in Nashville now for 10 years, and next year they're going to Atlanta. Oh, interesting. Yeah. They're going to start sort of going to different cities like they used to. You know, I've, yes, I've been going like to this thing for to. decades, and it used to, you know, every year be like, you know, Miami or San Francisco or wherever. And, and that's going to be fun. Yes. Awesome. 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 Well, that'll be fun to, to head down to Atlanta, another great city. Uh, hey, let's talk about that show intro. That's Christine Usazawa, mm-hmm. and she's the chief uh, strategy officer at Shubes and founder of uh, Measure of Music, a free three-day weekend-long hybrid virtual conference, boot camp, and workshop to give industry hopefuls and career changers a crash course of career paths. Uh, within music and data. So if you missed the music, I'm sorry, the Measure of Music conference last month, go over to measureofmusic.com to watch replays. And by the way, I love that they talk about music and data together yeah. because it's a thing, Jay. Yeah, it's two of my favorite things. Uh, it's I know sort it of what I do for a living. Um, also this week in our mailbag, which we rarely do, we, we really get some incredible messages every week. And like, like one that we got this week from uh, Jesus Norris, I think that's how you pronounce it, from Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, mm-hmm. He writes, hi, my name is Jesus and I'm a music industry study student at Cal Poly Pomona. Our music management classes uses Your Morning Coffee for our weekly readings every week, so thank you. We just had a project in which we worked together to release a song on all platforms. And here it is. Yeah. 
like creatures All tied up like a sneaker And I gotta say, I like it. Great little Rhodes piano playing in there. I, I assume it's a sample of a Rhodes piano, but uh, pretty darn good, actually. And then, uh, Jay, you've got a couple of speaking engagements coming up. In fact, I think you're going to be at USC this week, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, in a couple of days. Um, uh, the uh, USC Thornton School of Music, uh, collaborating with my good friend Bobby Borg. His classes are awesome. Uh, and if you uh, haven't seen the uh, books that he's written, uh, go on to uh, Amazon or wherever your uh, books are sold. He's got some amazing uh, music industry books. Uh, and then, of course, next week I'm going to Ohio University for their Music Industry Summit. By the way, you can um, registration is still open uh, for that. So you can join them April 9th and 10th. It's free and open to everyone. You just go to uh, their website, which is ohio.edu slash music industry summit, or go to their website. But uh, I'm pretty excited for those two days there at the Ohio University Music Industry Summit. That'll be fun. It might be a little chilly there, Jay. You might want to take your Bring jacket. jacket. Uh, okay. Indeed, right. indeed, indeed. And hey, how about our friend Ari Herstan's Ari's Take newsletter this past week? Uh, he had a thing in the subject that says, has your music been taken down from Spotify because of artificial streaming? He said, I'm going to write about this for Variety, and I'd like to gather some stories from artists who, who this has happened to. If your music has been removed from Spotify via your distributor, please hit reply and let me know what happened. Oh, yeah. I can't wait for that piece to uh, to come out. You know, we're big uh, fans of Ari and his blog and newsletter and his book, and we've had him on the podcast. Uh, just a, a great guy. So you can sign up for Ari's newsletter and check out his blog and, and the podcast at ariestake.com. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so this week um, uh, we had this... The story that came across, and, and the, it was from uh, Brian Hyatt over at Rolling Stone, and the headline was, uh, A Chat GPT for Music is Here, Inside Suno, the Startup Changing Everything. And uh, wait until you hear this stuff. I mean, <clears throat> online, Suno's creations are starting to generate reactions like, how the F is this real? As the, um, as the particular tracks play, that's easy for you to say, over a Sonos speaker in a conference room in uh, Suno's temporary headquarters, steps away from the Harvard uh, campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts, even some of the people behind the technology are ever so slightly unnerved. I mean, there's, there's some nervous laughter alongside of murmurs like, holy shit. And oh boy, it's mid-February and we we're playing with their new model, uh, version three, which is still a couple of weeks away from public release. But I've been playing with this thing and we'll get into <laughs> what you can do with God. it in a second. It's unbelievable. So the story goes on over the past year alone, generative AI has made major strides in producing credible text images via services like MidJourney and even video, particularly with OpenAI's new Sora tool. But audio and music and particular has lagged. Suno appears to be cracking the code to AI music and its founders' ambitions are nearly limitless. They imagine a world of wildly democratized music making. The most vocal of the co-founders, Mikey Schulman, a boyishly charming backpack toting 37-year-old <laughs> with a Harvard PhD in physics, envisions a billion people worldwide paying 10 bucks a month to create songs with Suno. The fact that music listeners so vastly outnumber music makers at the moment is so lopsided, he argues, seeing Suno is poised to fix that perceived imbalance. Man, I didn't know what to think of this when I first read this, but when you listen to it, and you will in a second, uh, it's... It's crazy. OpenAI faces multiple lawsuits over ChatGPT's use of books, news articles, and other copyrighted material in its vast uh, training data, right? But Suno's founders declined to reveal details of just what data they're shoveling into their own model, other than the fact that the, you know, it's got the ability to generate convincing human vocals. And that comes in part because it's learning from recordings of speech in addition to music. So Suno says it's in communication with the major labels and professionals 
and 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 our and profess respect for artists and intellectual property. Its tool won't allow you to uh, request any specific artist styles in your prompts, and doesn't use um, artist voices. Many Suno employees are musicians. There's a piano and guitars in ha- on hand in office, and framed images of classical composers on the walls. The founders uh, envision none of the open hostility to the music business that characterized, say, Napster before the lawsuits that destroyed it. Right. So Suno is hyper-focused on reaching music fans who want to create songs for fun. It could still end up causing significant disruption along the way. So in the short term, the segment of the market for human creators that is most directly endangered is it's a lucrative one. You know, songs created for ads, you know, and and even TV shows. Uh, Lucas Keller, founder of the management firm Milk and Honey, notes that the market for placing well-known songs will remain unaffected. Quote, but in the terms of the rest of it, yeah, it could definitely put a dent in the business, he says. I think that ultimately it allows a, a lot of ad agencies, film studios, and networks to not to have to go license stuff. So yeah, here's a song yeah, yeah. that I created using the Suno platform, and I just gave it some text prompts about you know creating a song in a certain style. Um, about the Your Morning Coffee newsletter and podcast. And the platform came up with the name of the song, which is Coffee and Headlines. Let's listen to this. Well, before we do that, before we do that, tell me how long it took you to do whatever you did first. Nine seconds, <laughs> 10 seconds. I typed in a, a couple of prompts. It, it took no time at all. Okay, here we go. Wake up, be in the morning. Gotta start the day right. Reach out for my coffee. Gotta have that morning light Sipping on the caffeine Feeling the magic flow As I read the headlines News that I need to know Coffee and headlines Oh my god, Jay <laughs> Yeah. It's, well, and if you've if you've used Chat GPT and and you know, but you probably remember the first time you used it, and you're like, "Damn, it was mind blowing." <laughs> it was mind blowing, and this is kind of exponentially more mind blowing. Yeah. That's the best way of describing it. It's it's crazy, and when you go, uh, you just got to check it out. It's unbelievable. Yeah, easy. Go to the Suno website. Um, it's in beta right now, but it's rolling out. But even by just going to their website, they have sort of the spinning wheel of different songs that were created with Suno. And one of them is about the moon or something like that. And I sent that song uh, to you and to uh, a few of my friends. And the first thing I said when I sent it to them is before I tell you who did this song, tell me what you think of it. And I had, you know, several people send me a note back saying, this is world-class. This is great. This is really catchy. This is a really great song. The guy's got a great voice. And then I dropped the bomb. I said, this is complete, completely uh, done with AI. And, and their minds were blown because it's not, it's not like the first few, you know, or versions of AI. It's getting exponentially better and better as time goes on. And this could be something really big. And it's, it's exciting on one level, but it's also depressing on another. Cause I don't want anybody who's an active musician that's writing and recording and touring and doing all those things to have their song not put into a TV show, video game film, because it can be easily created in AI. Now it's getting to that level now where the quality is that good. And it's, it's getting crazy. Yeah. It so, really, really is. So that that was the song created with AI. And and speaking of AI, this week I was exploring this new text to video generator where you just do, you know, you type in a text prompt and it creates an actual video for you. And I had read an article where this TikTok uh, influencer was using this platform to create these videos for TikTok because they're such high quality and you can turn around so many of them. And, and the platform is called Bith AI. B-I-T-H, Bith, and your autocorrect will change it to both. So you'll have to <laughs> correct yes. that. So that's it, dot AI, by the way, right? Yep. Bith dot AI. Thank you. Mm-hmm. It creates amazing videos from text prompts. So I asked it to create a video on the problem of streaming fraud, specifically bots 
and spin farms. And I sent the video to you so you could see it. And of course, this is an audio podcast, so you're only going to hear the audio of it. But Biff.ai named the video Unmasking the Illusion of Streaming Music. So here is the audio from the video it created for me. Think all music streams are legit? In the world of streaming music, not all plays are what they seem. Behind the scenes, spin farms and bots are gaming the system. These fraudulent methods generate fake streams, artificially inflating the popularity of songs. Spin farms use vast networks of controlled devices, while bots mimic human behavior, both skewing true listener numbers. This deception not only misleads fans, but also robs genuine artists of earnings and recognition. It disrupts the music industry's economy, affecting charts, royalties, and what music you might discover next. Is your favorite song truly trending? Oh my God. It's just, I mean, it is, this technology is coming so fast and furious and you know, and it, it, it feels like, you know, in the past, and we worked, you know, at Universal and the Advanced Technology Group, and in, yeah, we did. you know, we used to see, you know, uh, kind of early versions of things, and then it gets improved. This stuff out of the gate is ridiculously tight, and it's really, really amazing. I mean, yeah. I, it's it's almost... I'm almost speechless, you know, checking out some of this stuff just to this last week. Yeah. And the thing that really got me was same with chat GPT. When I first started using that is how the information that it feeds back to you is like somebody speaking. It's like how you write. Yes. It's, it's very human, which is weird because it's very not human, but it's the same with this music, uh, you know, done with a, a prompt that we just played and, and the, this video that it made for me with Biff.ai is it sounds like something a human would say. And it took my prompt, which was very short. Again, it took me five seconds to type out that sentence and it made this beautiful um, video as the woman's voice was talking about the different things about bots and spin farms and what they are, these images would change in the background. Yes. And it was, it was really beautifully done. So again, th this stuff's been around for like a day and a half and it's only <laughs> going to get better and better, but it's already grown in leaps and bounds and it's, it's super exciting. It is. Hey, before we get into our stories, OJ, let's thank our sponsors because uh, yeah. we certainly appreciate their participation every week. Yeah, we uh, the Your Morning Coffee podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Banzoogle. For over 20 years, Banzoogle has made it easy to build a stunning website and online store for your music. Now they've added a brand new EPK plan so that musicians can create professional single page electronic press kits in minutes. All the features you need to design an EPK are already built in, including fully customizable templates, preset EPK page layouts, music players, images, text bio, and video embeds, a gig calendar and press quotes, and access to Banzoogle's award-winning support team seven days a week. The new EPK plan starts at just $6.95 a month, and your morning, coffee, your morning coffee podcast listeners can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days, and then use the promo Promo code morning coffee EPK. That's all one word to get 10% off the first year of the new EPK plan subscription. That's banzoogle.com promo code morning coffee EPK when you sign up to the EPK plan. Yes, sir. And we're also brought to you by HypeBot. Since 2004, HypeBot has chronicled the new music industry and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. Edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton, hey Bruce, with uh, help from Alana Bonilla, Hypot, and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by live music discovery and marketing platform Bands in Town. Oh yeah, Bands in Town. Over 80 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts, recommendations, and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist service platform, connecting over 590,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote their tour dates across all platforms. Yes, and finally, the Music Business Association, as we were mentioning before, the Music Biz Conference creates the rooms in which the important conversations 
that shape the future of our industry take place. Representing more than 90% of the music industry at large, the Music Business Association serves as a connective tissue for the global music business and provides a trusted forum where ideas and collaboration can flourish. Uh, you should you should be there. Join us uh, for the Music Biz 2024 conference, May 13th through the 16th in Nashville. I'll be moderating a panel with some very smart people. And as I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, there was a, a release this last week where, you know, they mentioned they're going to be in Atlanta next year. They've been in uh, Nashville for the last 10 years. Um, the conference attracts more than 2,300 uh, music business professionals uh, every year. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. They're, they're saying that, uh, you know, according to Portia Sabin, um, who's the head of the Music Business Association, she said that we'll be on a, you know, probably a two-year schedule staying in a town for two years before going to another town. And as you and I were talking about before we hit record, that's sort of how it used to be um, yeah, when it was days. NARM. You know, we would have mm-hmm. it in different cities. So I go every year. I have for, gosh, probably 25 years now. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, a change in scenery, love Nashville, but it'll be nice to, uh, you know, see some new restaurants and see people in, in a different area. And by the way, just cause it's going to Atlanta does not mean that Jay is still not buying drinks. So oh, just so man. everybody knows, come on. So big thanks to Ban Zugo, hype bot bands in town of the music business association and a man who needs no introduction and yet I am introducing him, <laughs> strangely enough. Uh, I get to do the show every week with my friend Jay Gilbert, a good friend of 25 years. Music industry, He's a music industry consultant. He's the curator of the weekly Your Morning Coffee newsletter and, of course, a former executive with Universal Music, Sony Music, and Warner Music Groups. Wow, I'm old. Um, and, and I get to do this podcast every single week with my good friend, Mike Edchart, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records, Warner Music, Capital EMI, and Universal Music Group. And yeah, you've been around the block or two yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah. The road is littered with companies I have worked for. So uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, Jay, what do you say we jump into story number one? Yeah, story number one, man. Um, this This one... It started a firestorm this week, and I, I didn't know when I first read it how it was going to light people up. Um, but it, it's <laughs> by <laughs> it's by Damon Krakowski uh, for the Guardian. Uh, Damon's a writer and musician. We'll get into that in a second. But uh, the headline was: How are musicians supposed to survive on less than two hundredths of a penny? And Man, oh man. So according to Damon, the the way musicians are compensated is highly unfair. Uh, He writes that in a new bill in the U.S., Congress could fix all that. And as he says, uh, it's about time. So he goes on to write, many of the younger musicians I know, musicians uh, in the full flush of their career, don't see a path forward toward making a living. These aren't artists failing to connect with a public. On the contrary, they are releasing widely reviewed albums, going on tours, and communicating constantly with their fans via social media. But this work is not paying them enough to manage without second jobs or side hustles. Yeah, he goes on to say that that's a broken system. It's not just broken for individual artists. It's broken for our society as a whole. We all benefit from music. And, and I believe we as a society want that music to come from as wide and deep and rich and varied sources as exist. How could we not? Yet that's not what is paramount for those holding the finances of recorded music in their hands. In the platform era, the income for recording artists depends on a handful of massively capitalized corporations. Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and Google dominate streaming, and streaming now accounts for 84% of all recorded music revenue in the U.S. There's almost nothing left for recorded music outside that system. Hmm. Well, um, what that system is paying for content is an average across these platforms, um, approximately two hundredths of a penny. And that meager amount, believe it or not, doesn't even go directly to the artist. It goes to the rights holder for the master recording, that is, um, which is usually a record label. And then, you know, that split, uh, they split that income with artists according to individual contracts, um, with a typical artist share somewhere between 15 and 50%. 
Yeah, so that's a per stream amount, by the way. So the math at this point is beyond ridiculous, which is why so many younger artists I know simply don't see a path forward in recorded music. What's more, this crisis has come to a head just as AI enters the scene, threatening to do away with much original recorded music altogether. Okay, I'm going to try not to editorialize and try to get through this and then we will <laughs> we will listen to the rebuttal on the other side. So stay with us yeah. folks. So what to do? Uh, we need to rethink the finances of streaming. We need to let artists have a say in how the money from this new technology, and there's a lot of it, it's 84% of the entire recorded music industry after all, and how that is shared. Uh, to date, artists have had no seat at the table as streaming platforms and the three major labels, uh, Universal, Warner, and Sony, they've decided the revenue from this medium, how it would flow. So a new bill introduced uh, to Congress by the representatives Rashida Tlaib and Jamal Bowman uh, from two of the powerhouse music districts in the country, Detroit and the Bronx, would do much to correct this problem. The Living Wage for Musicians Act would bring more money for artists into the system and for the first time create a direct pathway for that money to flow from streaming platforms directly to recording musicians. Right. The Living Wage for Musicians Act proposes a straightforward mechanism, uh, an additional subscription fee earmarked for artists, plus a percentage of platforms' non-subscription revenue to cover ad-supported, which is free, streaming, and you know how that is paid and, and into an artist compensation royalty fund. That fund, administered by a nonprofit, would then distribute the money directly to artists uh, to their monthly share of streams. A maximum cap on earnings per track per month would ensure a more progressive distribution of the new royalty to help uh, create more sustainable careers and, and more genres and more diverse communities of music. So as you may remember, this direct payment is not a new idea for recorded music or for Congress. When satellite and internet radio first came online in the 1990s, Congress passed a law creating a pathway for payments from these new platforms straight to musicians. A nonprofit was established to correct the revenue, to collect the revenue, and distribute it. That's Sound Exchange, and has been doing so efficiently since the early 2000s. The administrative apparatus for this already exists. However, when streaming emerged, um, like so many other disruptive tech businesses, it dodged existing regu regulations and has to date avoided any direct payments to recording artists. The platforms and the major labels have had more or less a free hand to develop this technology and its payment systems uh, over a decade, and they have failed artists as they did. Congress needs to step in and make streaming work also for those who create the music that we all, and I mean all of us, musicians and listeners need. So that was the article. That was the article. And that and I, lit some people up and you and I were sharing uh, comments all week. And uh, it, it uh, in its, on its face, there's some points in there that you're, you're going, yeah, that, that seems reasonable. And you and I talk about the economics of streaming uh, quite a bit. But there's a little bit more to it, isn't there, Mike? There is. So let's go with the rebuttal from Bob Lefsetz, who's a popular blog, who has a popular blog and newsletter, the Lefsetz Letter, been around for years. He's in many ways the grandfather of doing what we do. Absolutely. So, so he says, this is what I hate about America. It's all about self-interest. People believe they're entitled to a living and the truth is irrelevant. Bob goes on to say, Mr. Krukowski was in the band Galaxy 500. Their albums were released by Rough Trade. Assuming the label gave them an advance to make them, I doubt there were any significant royalties paid. I'm aware of Galaxy 500, but even household name bands from 30 plus years ago never went into royalties. Yeah, he goes on to say that now Mr. Krukowski has since moved on from that band. Presently, he has an act with his wife entitled uh, Damon and Naomi. Um, go to the desktop version of Spotify where streaming totals are published. Damon and Naomi's hit, in parentheses, uh, entitled ETA, has a whopping 108,000 streams. No other track of their top 10 breaks 100,000. This is a hobby, not a career. And this guy deserves to get paid? Uh, Bob says, dig a little deeper and you'll find out that Krukowski went to Harvard, has taught there. I don't think he's starving. He's just standing up for the little guy. As for the payment per stream, 
makes a good headline that Mr. Krukowski pulled that number out of his ass. There are different payments for different kinds of streaming, but the public is drawn to over-the-top headlines. It makes the story sexier. Yeah. He says, how come these acts can't realize that you get paid based on the number of times um, you know, someone listens to your music. I mean, basically that's fair as for dividing up revenue based on what an individual subscriber listens to. That's fine with me. But one study said the big acts end up making more that way. So if people don't listen that much, how much money are we talking about anyway? <laughs> so, uh, so then we've got Michael McCarthy, who's the CEO of Kilometer Music Group, who wrote to Bob. He said, the problem is people hear the word million associated with their stream counts and think that it should equal lots of dollars. Then they look at the imputed per stream rate and think it's pathetic. The facts are this. DSPs pay 50 to 70% of their gross revenues to the royalty pool. More than ten, more than a ten times rate, uh, more than ten times radio, and successful records earn big bucks from streaming. Yeah, uh, he goes on to say that complainers are either not popular or have deals with a label or publisher that is either still recouping the advance, or is an old school deal uh, taking most of the pie. It's useful to think of each stream as an impression and compare it to radio impressions and royalties. Since U.S. radio doesn't pay the performer, you know, master royalties, um, keep it to publishing only. Take a typical audience for a major market pop station and one spin is equal to one X that audience in impressions. Take what BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, GMR, what they pay per spin and divide the audience side you get an amount per radio impression that is not light years away from the publishing part of the per stream rate. So to get a million impressions on radio, you might need somewhere around 10 to 100 spins depending on the size of the station. Nobody would think they are successful or expect large royalty checks if they only had that many spins at U.S. radio. Big records have hundreds of millions or billions of streams and radio impressions. The radio and streaming royalties generated by a world-class hit are significant, and I don't hear people attached to these hits complaining. It's a hits-driven business. Mm. Always has been. Always will be. Right. The real injustice in streaming is the four or five to one ratio of the value of the master versus publishing. That's a travesty and hopefully unsustainable. Um, there's no fundamental legal or economic reason why it shouldn't be one to one. Uh, it's just the result of a historic industry power imbalance favoring the record labels. So uh, Bob Anderson also wrote in and put it very succinctly. The music business doesn't exist anymore. Nobody is getting paid. Really? How many times do we have to hear this? It reminds me of the election being stolen. Say it enough times and people believe it. Streaming royalty payments vary according to the arrangements artists have with their labels and distributors, not with the streaming services. Pretty simple. Blame your team, not the streaming services. Amen. Look, it's wow. Something, we've talked about this a lot. You know, streaming services don't pay artists; they pay the rights holders, mm -hmm. and that's typically the labels. And they pay out. In the article, they say you know between fifty and seventy percent. It's closer to seventy percent. And yes, yeah. as Bob points out, you can't just put one number on that because there's ad supported. You know, uh, streaming. There's family plans and student plans and paid premium stream. There's so many different line items in that statement that, and I don't know where that number came from, but I thought this was a really interesting look at sort of, uh, you know, uh, this, this hot issue that, you know, I hear it all the time. People come up and they're, Oh, well, you know, Spotify doesn't pay artists enough. Well, they don't pay artists. They pay the rights holder and they're paying about 70% of what they take in. And look, I've said this before and, and I'll stand by it. Uh, a stream is not worth a download and a download is not worth a CD and a CD is not worth premium vinyl, et cetera. And I'm sorry it's that way, but it is. I would love to see songwriters paid more and I would like to see, you know, subscription fees be increased. There's a lot of things I'd like to change about this whole streaming ecosystem, but you know, I'm sorry. It's, this is the new world. 
Well, and you know, I, 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 I like to think you and I are about as sympathetic towards musicians as anybody yeah. because we grew up in garages with bad playing bands, which we turned into hopefully better, better playing bands. And, you know, we've been through that. And when we were starting out, uh, you really kind of had to get a record deal. And the notion that we could record something really inexpensively that would turn out really, really well, um, and then be up there with all the major artists was like a pipe dream to us. If we knew about that, which of course wasn't possible in those days, we would have been over the moon. Well, be careful what you wish for, because that is now what we have. And anybody can upload music. Yeah. Anybody. And they do. And, and they do. Uh, but by, as Bob mentioned, you know, I, I think uh, lots of musicians think that because they're making good music, that they deserve to make that their living. And unfortunately, that's just not the way the world works. And so uh, this discussion will continue to be had. But it's, you know, I mean, and you and I talked about this before we started the show. You have a unique perspective because you're putting out the newsletter on Thursday, uh, Thursday night. And then on Friday when it hits, you see the reactions to all the all of the the stories that you're covering in the newsletter, and uh, like you said, this one was was really active in terms of responses. And everybody was sending me um, Bob Left sets his newsletter, which I subscribe, but I appreciate it. Um, and then there was, you know, from time to time, he'll uh, send a newsletter out with uh, people that have written in with commentary on what he's been talking about. And we're just scratching the surface. It it really fired up a, a lot of people this week. So great job, uh, Bob Bob Lefsetz, um, and and company. And story number two this week is from Billboard. Our friend Glenn Peoples. Um, it really I first saw it. Um, it was in his weekly newsletter, The Ledger, and I read the full article on Billboard Pro. The headline is RIAA Report 2023 Takeaways: Is the U.S. Too Reliant on um, on paid subscriptions. And just so people know, it's it's report season. And last week we reported on the IFPI. We talked about Midia's report. We talked about Luminate's report. And they're all just a little bit different. And we explained last week on the podcast, if you haven't uh, listened to that, we explained sort of why um, Midia is different than IFPI, for example. Those are global. What we're talking about now with the RAAA report is really U.S. only. And so Glenn starts it off by saying, with the domestic market more reliant on subscriptions, you know, more reliant than ever, growth on that front is slowing. Uh, the most other, um, and most other categories aren't contributing much uptick yet. Right. So the RAAA's release of 2023 revenue figures uh, show U.S. record labels are increasingly reliant, possibly too much so, on paid subscriptions for both revenue and revenue growth. While consumers continue to pay for premium streaming services, ad-supported on-demand streaming is languishing and newer platforms like TikTok provide more promotion than they do royalties. Ah, the top line takeaway of the RIAA's 2023 report, just came out last week, is that the U.S. market grew about almost 8% to $17 billion, an improvement from you know the 66 percent up uptick the previous year. So without adjusting for inflation, uh, inflation, 2023 revenue was about 17% above the CD era peak of about 14.6 billion set in 1999. We often talk about 1999 as that mark, uh, that change in the industry. So this is marking the ninth straight year of revenue growth after the U.S. market bottomed out at almost seven billion in 2014. After nearly a decade of gains, the record business is healthy and stable. Yes, but look over at the RIAA's report and you'll see the U.S. market is missing the dynamism it could and wants to have. The revenue mix doesn't have the diversity of past years. It's not for lack of effort. Record labels are partnering with AI startups, licensing music to social media platforms, and looking for new ways to engage with big spending super fans. But emerging categories remain just that, emerging, while other categories don't yet provide much of a revenue boost. On-demand streaming turned around the industry, made music into an appealing asset class for investors, and allowed handfuls of companies to go public. But where does it go from here? Well, this is where it goes. Glenn wrote um, five takeaways 
uh, from the RIAA report, and I'll take number one, and that is the U.S. market is more reliant on paid subscriptions than ever. Revenue from paid subscriptions from premium music streaming services like Spotify and Apple Music totaled ten. dollars Point one five billion dollars, and accounted for fifty nine point three percent of the total recorded music revenues in twenty twenty three. That was an increase from fifty seven point eight percent in twenty twenty two, and far higher than percentages seen during the preceding years. And uh, he lists all those in this article. But U.S. labels were even more reliant on subscriptions for revenue growth, with paid subscriptions accounting for 79.4% of that growth in 2023. Ad-supported streaming, you know, services like TikTok and Facebook, grew 21.5% or $56.2 million, but only accounted for about 4.6% of annual growth. Right. So he goes on to say, uh, number two is new subscribers are harder to find. Fortunately for the U.S., subscription penetration has surpassed 50 percent of U.S. Internet users, according to Music Watch. But the 2023 RIAA figure suggests streaming services have already picked the low-hanging fruit and will need new products to attract new customers. With far fewer new subscribers in 2023 than in previous years, labels were fortunate that Spotify raised the price for its standard individual plan uh, last year after adding 7.6 million subscribers in 2022, 8.5 million back in 2021. The U.S. market added just 5.2 million in 2023. That is a sharp drop from the 15.1 million new subscribers gained in 2020 when pandemic restrictions caused an uptick in both music and video on-demand streaming services. Prices, price increases by Spotify in July and Amazon Music in both January 2023 and August help average monthly revenue per user improve to about $8.74. That's up from $8.35 back in 2022. Yeah, it's I still grossly underpriced in, in my humble opinion. Um, number three, Glenn points out, is advertising has stumbled. Ad-supported on-demand streaming, the revenue from it, rose just 2.3% last year. And even worse showing than the 3.5% improvement the previous year, ad-supported on-demand streaming actually did better in pandemic-stricken 2020. It rose 32.2%, even though the bottom fell out of the ad market when brands braced for a recession by curtailing their ad spending. It was a remarkable turn of fortune for the promise of ad-supported music. After Spotify's ad-supported revenue jumped 81% in 2021, CEO Daniel X said the growing online ad market bode well for India, Indonesia, and other developing markets where Spotify operates. Since then, however, subscriptions, especially in mature markets like the United States, have carried the load for Spotify and, and others. Right. So number four is social media is growing fast but remain small. The highest growth rate of any category uh, last year came from other ad-supported streaming, which includes relative newcomers to licensing agreements such as TikTok. Other ad-supported streaming jumped 21.5% to about a little over $317 million, making the category about 75% as valuable as the fast-declining download and ringtone category, which was down 12.2% last year. The downside is that the category remains a small part of labels business. Last year, other ad-supported streaming accounted for less than 5% of total revenue growth about 6% as much as subscription services. Yeah, and the last thing, number five, physical sales were dependable, not explosive. Both LPs and CDs had double-digit growth in 2023, 10.3% for LPs and 11.3% for CDs. That's good. As physical formats benefited from enthusiasm for vinyl collectibles, K-pop fans penchant for buying multiple CD variants of the new releases, Total physical revenue increased by $181 million, or 10.5%, to $1.9 billion. And, and it's grown 66% since 2018. The more than comp, that more than compensated for the $60 million decline in legacy digital formats like uh, track and album downloads and ringtones that you just mentioned. Still, vinyl and CD sales accounted for almost 15% of 2023's revenue gains compared to subscriptions 
79.4%. Yeah, good point. Good article by Glenn. But, you know, okay, so if we're too reliant on paid subscriptions, but what do you do? That's, <laughs> I don't know what yeah. you do about that. Well, there's so many other ways to monetize um, music today. And I think people are getting very creative um, at that. And something you and I talk about quite a bit is how does a developing or middle-class artist make revenue today? And it's, it's not typically from a lot of streaming. It's, you know, premium vinyl and, and merch at their, you know, at their merch table at the shows and it's from touring and, there, there are other ways to make money. There's experiences, there's loops and beats, there's, you know, I mean, publishing's a beast, but I think there are going to be things that we haven't thought of. And, and the reason I say that is this week, you and I covered an AI platform that basically will write a song from a mm-hmm. text prompt that's pretty good um, and getting better. And then one that will create, you know, short form videos uh, for you. Um, We've seen some artists that are creating full on music videos using AI and listen, this is not going away and the technology is getting better and better. Uh, I see it. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this too. I see it as like Les Paul electrifying the guitar that initially people are just like, this is blasphemy. You know, Mm -hmm. this is going to ruin the music industry. And then it becomes, you know, like the drum machine it's, it's hated at first. And then it becomes a, one of those tools that you use just a part of it. Exactly. We were all kind of horrified when all those things kind of happened, we we weren't around for the electrification of the guitar, but yeah, you know, when synthesizers came out, people flipped out when samplers came out, people flipped out and yeah, you know, once we, we kind of calm down, you know, and maybe think about it, is that the next wave of music, uh, monetization. It must be, you know, it's going to be, uh, and, and my question is, as I'm reading those articles about these companies, these AI companies, how long before they're gobbled up by one of the majors? Um, maybe before next week's show, you know, maybe know. Um, cause we're seeing yeah. that we, we talked about mm-hmm. that company Endel, um, yes. doing generative AI and creating these, uh, soundscapes and universal bottom. And now they're, yeah. they're owned by Universal. So I think you're absolutely right. It'll be really fun to watch this evolve. It's such a crazy, exciting time in the music industry. All right, Jay. Well, it's time to wrap up the show. Boy, we had some really interesting stuff. I mean, when we, you and I were prepping for this, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> When we listening to that AI stuff, it was just mind blowing. So uh, we hope you all enjoyed the show, Jay, and I certainly love uh, and appreciate putting this on every week and appreciate that people actually listen to it. So on that note, if you enjoy the show, please tell one friend, Jay, and I would certainly appreciate that. And big thanks to Banzugo Hypebot, Bands in Town and the Music Business Association. Couldn't do it without those wonderful folks. So on that note, thanks for listening. Jay and I will be back next week on the Your Morning Coffee Podcast. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know.